let's turn to God's Word to Luke chapter 18 and let's study this portion together. Who doesn't want everything to be made right? Are you fed up with the brokenness of this world, with its viruses and cancers, with its ageing, uh, with violence and injustice, with trafficking and abuse? Who wouldn't want it all to be made right? And that's the great hope that the Bible holds out to us. Everything that is in us that cries out, this isn't how it should be, is right. It's like an echo of the very, in the very fabric of creation. It's as if this universe has in it a memory of all that was good and perfect. And as Paul puts it, is groaning, longing for that day when it will be restored. And there's something in that that resonates in our hearts and lives. Our desire for justice. Our desire that life isn't ruined by sickness or accident or ends in death. We know death isn't natural. We know it's an ugly intruder. We know, we know it brings to an end all that is good and lovely in someone. These aren't false instincts. We were made for something better. And hope is a reality. It's not pie in the sky. It's not a false dawn. Because a new day will come. And that's why Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Your kingdom come. These three words are game changers. Your kingdom come. How often have you prayed them? I'm guessing it's hundreds, if not thousands of times. But have they lost their potency for us? Or maybe they seem disconnected from 2020, from reality. But a new day will dawn. The king will come. The kingdom will arrive. And everything will be made new. And the reason that we can be certain of this is that the king has already risen. The next thing on his calendar is his return. And him making all things new. And our parable this morning is a twin of last week's parable. The friend at midnight, both in its style and its content, they're both about prayer. They're both of a similar style, as we'll see in a moment. But the prayer that this one about is about is about a specific truth. Remember that originally the, there were no chapter divisions in the Bible. They're handy for finding things, but sometimes they break the connections. You see, in Luke 17, Jesus has been teaching the disciples some basic truths about his return. What it'll be like, and what life will be like in that interim period. And then in chapter 18, he teaches them about prayer. But chapter 18, do you see, starts with this, this opening word, then. Then. And it links the teaching on prayer in chapter 18 to chapter 17's teaching about his return. So it's not just general prayer that Jesus is talking about. It's about prayer in light of his return. That longing for a new day to dawn. In fact, the, the two parables seem to deal with two halves of the Lord's prayer. The friend at midnight shows that God will provide our needs, our daily bread, as we ask, seek and knock. It encourages not to give up asking for our daily needs. And this parable ties in with that request at the start of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we're not to give up asking for that either. We find it quite easy perhaps to remember to pray for our daily needs. But what about this? Are you living in the light of Jesus' return? This chapter gives us several key facts. We're told that he is coming back. Jesus says it will be just like this when the Son of Man is revealed. We're told that Jesus' return will be delayed. Verse 7 implies it. Will he keep putting them off? We're told that the, the space in between, his being here with the disciples and his return, won't be easy. Christians are compared to Noah and Lot in their day in chapter 17. And in this parable, Christians are portrayed 
as a harassed widow. And then we're told that Jesus' return, when it happens, will be sudden. It's compared to lightning. We're told in verse 8 that he will come quickly. Maybe a better word would be suddenly, like the, the minute hand on a clock moves slowly. You can barely perceive it moving. But then as it comes to the top, suddenly there's a clanging and a whirring as the hour is struck. That's what it'll be like. Except for us now, we can't even see the minute hand and where it's coming. Is it close to the hour or is it far away from the hour? We don't know, but it is moving and the hour will be struck. So given that a new day will dawn, what kind of people ought we to be? We ought to be living and praying in the expectation that one day everything will be put right. And that's what we want to look at this morning. And we want to see three things. First of all, I want to challenge us to cultivate in prayer a hunger for Christ's return. Cultivate this hunger for Christ's return. If Jesus is coming back, that should colour everything we do. It should colour our expectations, our choices, our hopes, our fears, our dreams. Yet it is all too easy to, to forget about it, to live as if it's not going to happen or that it's just a distant event. And that's why Jesus tells his people to pray, your kingdom come, to keep it at the forefront of our minds and on the tip of our tongues. And here, having just told them about the truth, he urges them to let it shape their prayers. Now, I want us to grasp that it's not just about praying that Christ will return. It's not just about praying that we're thinking about this morning. It's about praying and living with the expectation that Christ is coming back. Do you see what Jesus says in verse uh, 7 or verse 8? However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? on the earth. More literally, this faith. When Jesus comes back, will he find this faith-filled expectation that he will return? Will he find his people on the edge of their seats longing for his appearing? Will he find it on the tip of our tongues crying out, your kingdom come? Will he find us looking to him to make all things new? whether in our bodies, whether in society, whether the injustices that we've suffered. Will he find it? It should colour everything. These are not small themes. They are not absent from God's thinking and they shouldn't be absent from ours. So let the thought of Christ's return cultivate in you a habit of prayer that then flavours and permeates through all of life. Look at verse 1 and see three words that Jesus uses. He says that we should, we should always pray. It's necessary. That word should could be translated, it is essential. It is vital. This is not an optional extra. It's the same word that's used in John 3, 7. You must be born again. It is vital for you to be born again. It is necessary for you and it is necessary for us to cultivate in prayer an expectation that Christ returns and not to give up. It is necessary. It's necessary that we pray this so that we don't lose heart and get gnarled up with the unfairness of life or lose perspective on trials or lose hope. If we don't pray this way, if we don't fuel our expectation in our prayers, we will live like those who have no hope. That would dishonour our Saviour who gave us incredible hope. Next word there is always. Our prayers for this are to be constant. We are to be always praying about Christ's return. It's to, to flavour our prayers in all sorts of ways. We find at the end of the book of Revelation Jesus promising to return. And I love the response of that elderly disciple John. Here is yearning. Come, Lord Jesus. He's, he's straining at the bit. He's longing for Christ to return. Paul describes uh, the people that he's writing to Timothy about, the believers who have loved or who have longed for Christ's appearing. Could you or I be described as a person who loves the thought of Christ appearing? 
and we're to be persistent, that we should always pray and not give up. Jesus knows that because this will be an event in the future, that the tendency for us who are so focused in the present is to despair and to lose heart and to become discouraged. And Jesus says, no matter how long the delay, don't lose sight of this. Don't lose sight of it. It's a vital necessity to cultivate in ourselves, in our prayers, this expectant faith that Jesus is coming back. As it were, will he find us on our knees and looking to heaven when he returns? But it's not easy to do that. So Jesus doesn't just tell them that he's coming. He tells them a parable to encourage us and the disciples to pray. And that's what we want to see secondly, uh, to help us cultivate in prayer this hunger for Christ's return. Secondly, there's encouragement to pray for Christ's return. And this takes us into the parable itself. Now, it's vital that we note that this is not a parable of comparison, like the lost sheep, where we're like the sheep and Jesus is like the, the shepherd. This parable is like last week's parable, a parable of contrasts from the lesser to the greater, or maybe more accurately, from the worse to the best. Last week in the parable of the friend at midnight, if the grumpy neighbour got up and gave daily bread, how much more likely is it that your Father in heaven will supply your daily needs? And here, if the unjust judge eventually gave justice, how much more will the true judge of all the earth deal justly? And so we're introduced to the two main characters. But remember, it's about contrast. There's the judge, and he's a bounder. He's a cad. He doesn't fear God, and he doesn't care about men. So he breaks the two great commandments, and he's proud of it. You know, he glories in it. Verse 4 says, even though I don't fear God or care what people think. You couldn't go to this man and say, with reverence, for God's sake, would you please help? Nor could you say to him, for my sake, would you do this? He didn't care. What a wretched man to be in a place of authority. And then there's the widow. She may or may not be an elderly lady. Girls often married quite young in Palestine in those days and marrying an older man so she could be in her 20s or 30s. But she was vulnerable and that's the key thing. She had nobody to protect her. This particular one is in some financial need. She has no one to fight her case. No family, no friend, no money to pay a lawyer. She has to go herself. And so she has to approach this uncaring brute. One writer says that officials in that day in the Middle East, the only way to influence them was to bribe, bully or bother. Well, she doesn't have the money to bribe. She doesn't have the heft to bully, but she can bother. And boy, is she going to do it. And there's almost a comical aspect. You can imagine the people thinking of the scenario unfolding in the street. She keeps coming. The judge gets up in the morning and she pokes her head through the, the glassless window and she shouts at him, avenge me of my adversary. He, he goes for a walk at lunchtime and there she is again. Avenge me of my adversary. Shouting it across the street. He's sitting at the gate, noble and respected, hearing a session of the, the court and she comes along and she yells at him, avenge me. Avenge me of my adversary. He's sitting, having a meal with his wife, and that face appears at that glassless window again with that cry echoing round the house. He puts the cat out at night, and there she is again, day after day after day after day, coming and pleading and crying and shouting, and he's worn done. She's been stalking him, and he gives in and takes up her case and gives her justice. And what a way to make of it. Is Jesus saying that we are to not give up because we can badger God into giving in? 
I think if he wanted to convey that, it wouldn't be the parable of the unjust judge, but the parable of the persistent toddler. But it is a judge. And that's our clue. It's about justice. Jesus makes it clear for us in verse 7. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? It's about things being put right. And it's told to encourage you and me to pray without losing heart for a new day to dawn. A day where justice is done at a personal level, at a global level and even at the level of the cosmos. For all the aching and groaning of the universe and the brokenness of the creation will be made right. Keep coming to the judge with your request, Jesus says, because I will come back and behold, I will make everything new. Don't give up. And he sets out three contrasts here for us to encourage us to be persistent. There's a contrast, firstly, between the judge and God. The judge is cruel and unjust and indifferent. And God is holy and loving and compassionate. And Jesus is saying if such a judge will listen, how much more will our God listen? He loves us and cares for us individually. See how much he cares even for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. How much more will he care for us, his children, but the judge doesn't care about anything except himself. But our God cares for his people. And that's the point Jesus is making. If such a poor specimen of an earthly judge will promise justice, how much more, abundantly more, will our God do it? He's holy and compassionate. He loves righteousness and mercy and justice. So here is encouragement to pray. Pray because of who God is. Pray because of who our judge is. Then there's a second contrast between the widow and God's people. She's helpless and vulnerable and unconnected. And then look at verse 7. Jesus has a lovely description of God's people. God's chosen ones. God's chosen ones. What a lovely phrase. You could imagine a husband using it of his wife. My chosen one. It's tender. And it's, it's speaking of God's love for his people. A love that has stretched back before time even began to tick. God had set his love on us. There's a huge contrast. If the judge will answer the cries of someone who has no claim on him, Here's our phrase, how much more will God, our Father, listen to the prayers of those whom he has loved with an everlasting love? How much more? And in addition to that, the widow had no one to intercede in her behalf. She was alone. But you and I are not alone. The very Son of God himself is our advocate before the throne of God. And the Spirit intercedes for us as well. How much more will God hear our prayers? So pray because of who God is. Pray because of who you are. Who you are. You are precious to him. The brokenness in your life matters to your Father. He is not indifferent to it. And though he delay, he will yet answer. He will answer. So keep praying. And then the third contrast between her pleading and, and our prayers. Between the incessant badgering and pestering annoyance of the widow and what Jesus calls the cries. The cries of his chosen ones who cry out day and night. The humble, needy cries of his people. Oh, there's a difference. There's a difference between uh, somebody who's just uh, shouting and shouting and shouting and a child crying for help and their father hears. Oh, there's a difference. There's a difference. Her request was for herself. And our request 
is for God's glory and praise. Our request is for something that God longs to do. Our request is for something that the Father delights to do because this is how he created the world to be, to be made new and perfect. And his Son came to redeem it. And he delights to complete the Son's work of redemption. So pray because of who God is. Pray because of who you are. And pray because God takes pleasure in answering our prayers that Christ would come and make everything whole again. So here in little over a hundred words, Jesus encourages us to pray for that new day to dawn. Don't give up. You come to a judge who is a perfect judge and who will make everything right. Don't give up because you're close to him, his chosen ones. He loves you dearly and he will hear your cries. And don't give up because they're your cries the plaintive cries of his children, and this judge will hear and answer. Three encouragements to pray. Let us close with three reasons to pray for Christ's return. Reasons to pray for Christ's return. We we need to be girding up our our lives and our minds to think and to, to look forward and to be shaped by the return of Jesus Christ. We've lived in a semi-Christianized bubble in the West, almost like an imperfect copy of God's kingdom. Our laws and our morals and our standards all come from God's word. But for the early Christians and for the majority of the world and for the most of history, it hasn't been like that. It's been unjust and standards have not been based on God's word and perhaps if we lived in places where revenge killings were normal, where women were treated as goods and chattels, where the basic standards of justice don't exist, perhaps we might have a greater longing for a better world, for justice to be done and everything to be made right. So let me consider with you three reasons briefly to pray like this and to live like this. One, it will mean an end to trouble. It will mean an end to trouble. The widow was in trouble. And the judge eventually heard and put an end to her trouble. And you know, throughout the the New Testament, in almost every letter, there is this mention of Christ's return. Why did the first century Christians need to be reminded of it so much? It's because they were facing trouble hardship and persecution and sickness and suffering and sorrow were all part of everyday life. But when Christ would come, everything would change. No more sickness, no more suffering, no more loss, no more disappointment, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more aging death or hardship, no cancer, no multiple sclerosis, no dementia, no Alzheimer's. It will mean an end to trouble. Not one of the effects of sin in this world will escape the return of Christ. Everything will be made new. It's only with the return of Christ that there will be unbroken happiness and complete freedom from pain. Behold, I am making everything new, he says. So to pray for Christ's return is to pray for an end to suffering and hardship. It's to pray too for for justice or vindication. The widow was in the right. She had been done a great injustice by some unscrupulous person and nobody was listening. But the judge vindicated her and brought about justice. And there are all sorts of things in the world where there are great injustices and people get away with wickedness. I read a book on on organised crime a couple of years ago. And if ever there was anything to A, depress you and B, make you long for Christ to return, seeing this vast web of deceit and corruption spread all over the globe, and to cry out, it would make you cry out, Lord, come, judge of all the earth, come and do what's right and make everything right again. We look at situations where people have experienced terrible injustices and they will never be put right in this life 
And we should be praying for Christ to return and to judge the world and to make everything right. It will also mean vindication for Christ's people. Many places in the world today, they're mocked, ridiculed, imprisoned and persecuted. And their saviour is treated as a piece of dirt. And to pray for Christ to return is to pray that people would see that we are not foolish, we are not deluded, and that Christ cannot and must not be ignored. It's to pray that Christ will be vindicated, that every knee would bow before our Jesus and every tongue confess that he is Lord, for he is worthy of all honour and all praise and all glory. And as much as we love our Saviour, it should grieve us that our world doesn't worship him. And we should be crying out, come Lord Jesus, so that every knee will bow. And then thirdly, it means salvation. For God's chosen ones. Given what I've just said about praying that Christ will be vindicated and his people vindicated, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess, sometimes we hesitate to pray for Christ's return because many of our friends and family are not yet Christians. They're not ready. Well, we know two things about Christ's return. He is returning and we know also that not one of his chosen ones will perish. So put those together and we see that to pray for the coming of the kingdom, to pray for Christ to return, is to pray that his kingdom would expand to include all his chosen ones so they would all be brought in. Christ will not come until all of his chosen ones are saved. So to pray that he will return is to pray that he will change hearts and minds of husbands, wives, children, parents, grandparents, family, friends, neighbours. To pray that he will do it now. We don't need to fear. We don't need to hesitate. What encouragement there is to pray for his return. We're not praying that people will be left out. But we're praying that they will come to know Christ now. Are there issues of injustice that you really struggle with? Pray for Christ to return and usher in a new day. Are there issues of brokenness, broken bodies, disease, cancer that you're struggling with? Pray for Christ to return. Look forward to this new day. Maybe it's the trampling of Christianity and Christians underfoot in nations around the world. Pray for Christ to return. Maybe it's the big corporations and greed and exploitation and you can't see how they can be brought down pray for Christ to return maybe it's crime maybe it's the lies and deceit of whether it's the big players of the politicians or the media or whoever and it would cause you to despair pray for Christ to return and this will fill us with a hope. And in a world where other people are perhaps despairing over the same things, Christ's people will be marked with a hope, a looking forward, and a, a joy that can only come from outside time and space. And then people will ask us to give a reason for the hope that we have. For this vandalised world is not the end of the story. Our broken bodies are not the end of the story. A bleak graveside is not the end of the story. The Son of God says a new day will dawn. Wait for it, long for it, pray for it. Your kingdom come. Three words. Will you pray them? Will you pray them? Let me ask you, are you ready to pray them? I know some of you are ready. You are ready for the coming of King Jesus to reign and rule and restore. You are already living under his rule. You have sought shelter under his cross. You have repented of wearing your little make-believe crown and you have set it down at the feet of him who wears the crown of thorns. You are ready and longing for his kingdom to come. But perhaps there are some watching who aren't ready. For the king to come and for the judge to render judgment will be a terrible thing for you. It will mean not an eternity of unbrokenness, but an infinity of brokenness 
regret and despair. But you know, the very delay that Christians can struggle with, when's he coming back? Is he coming back? That very delay is for your benefit. He's patient with you, giving you time to take off your crown and to lay it at his feet, to stop seeking to run your own life your way and to be your own saviour. He's giving you time to come to him. And you know, astonishingly, the judge who will one day judge the world came into the world to be judged. And he was put to death on a cross so that you could escape judgment. And if you go to him now, if you go to him who was judged for you, you will have nothing to fear when he comes to judge the world. And you too will be able and eager to say, your kingdom come. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you that into a broken world, into sin-cursed lives, comes a hope, a hope that everything will be made new, a hope that is grounded in history because we see the King who will come to make everything new entering into time and history and walking through people's lives and scattering fragments of the newness as he went. The dead raised to life, the blind seeing, the lame walking, the hungry filled, broken bodies made new again. And we, we see those little first fruits, those glimmers, the proof that he can do it. And then we see him smashing the chains of the grave and rising himself in newness of life. And we look forward to his return, knowing that he is capable to make all things new. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would lift our eyes from this broken universe and our our sin-filled world and lift our eyes to see the King seated, as it were, on the edge of the throne, ready and eager to return and help us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, we pray for dear loved ones, our family and friends and neighbours who aren't ready for that day, that you would draw them to Christ now before it's too late. Father, we ask these things and ask that you would help us to keep praying persistently for Christ to return so that it will shape us and fill us with hope as we live here. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.